Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this annual meeting of the United Against Rabies Forum. I'm Sandy Trees. I'm a crossbench member of the House of Lords. That means I'm apolitical, uh, a member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. And I'm a vet and a parasitologist by specialist training. And uh, I've had an interest in rabies ever since I was an undergraduate veterinary student some 50 more years ago. And I'm delighted to be here in my capacity as chair of the United Against Rabies Forum steering group. This forum is only one year old. Uh, it was launched in September 2020 um, by the heads of the uh, FAO, the OIE and the WHO. But it's been a pretty eventful year. COVID, of course, has dominated all health initiatives and has taken a terrible toll on human life and on public health efforts, especially in low and middle income countries. Rabies is no exception and Dr. Deborah Nadal from the University of Glasgow has recently published a very interesting paper based on surveys and interviews covering some 50 countries across the United Against Rabies network. I commend the paper to you and I think the link should be showing on the chat box now. But the headlines are that uh, in 2020, financial resources allocated to rabies were reduced in 60% of countries surveyed and dog vaccination was often the first activity to go. People who feared they'd been exposed to rabies from a dog bite, uh, for them, the situation was terrible uh, with many reporting that clinics were closed uh, for post-exposure of vaccination or people were simply too frightened to attend hospitals because of COVID. At a global level, the pandemic meant that Gavi's plans to make rabies post-exposure prophylaxis vaccination for humans available to eligible partner nations is still on hold. And that's a very important initiative to help leverage support for dog vaccination. We know that community engagement and education are vital to rabies control. But almost every country in the survey reported that these programs had also been affected. Is there a silver lining uh, in this cloud? Well, uh, perhaps a small one. Uh, we do know that One Health, the global effort to integrate human health, animal health and environmental health is rising up the political agenda. It's been mentioned at many meetings uh, at very high level, including by our prime minister. And we've been making the case that rabies can be a platform for effective One Health implementation. I was also delighted to learn recently that in India, uh, India, uh, the Indian government has made human rabies a notifiable disease. This is a huge step uh, forward globally, as India, because of its huge population partly, is estimated to account for some 36% of all human rabies deaths worldwide. So reporting uh, will be mandatory for all government and private health facilities in India at national and state level using uh, standard case definitions. This is very good news indeed, and I commend the Indian government uh, for this decision. Coming back to today's dis uh, discussion, we will focus in more detail on the impact of the pandemic on rabies, the increased interest in One Health, and the importance of community engagement. Next week, on the 4th of October, we will be looking at data gaps and monitoring and tools and technology. And then the week after that, on Monday, the, uh, October the 11th, we will focus on uh, national and regional strategies uh, for rabies control, operational delivery of rabies control. And in between, we'll be sharing some key messages from our partners for World Rabies Day, which is of course tomorrow. Before I go, my final message is to encourage you to join the United Against Rabies Forum. We are actively inviting institutions and organizations to join us formally as members. It's free to join and our aim is to build a broad and inclusive uh, space for all those committed to ending human deaths from rabies by 2030. Please get in touch uh, with the Global Rabies Coordinator, Rachel Tidman, if you need more information. 
And now let's move on then to our first discussion. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Thumbi Mwangi from Kenya, <clears throat> who will chair this first session on rabies, One Health, and COVID-19. Over to you, uh, Thumbi. Well, many thanks, uh, Lord Tris. It's an honor to have you leading us, uh, the United Against Rabies Forum. Uh, as uh, Lord Tris has mentioned, my name is uh, Thumbi Mwangi, and I'm a veterinarian and infectious epidemiologist from Kenya. And I've been working on rabies for most of my career. Now it's clear that COVID has set back control effort, including rabies, uh, all over the world, especially in Africa. Now, COVID um, impact on rabies elimination efforts in my region in Eastern Africa includes the suspension of mass dog vaccination programs, the direction of resources, and seeing patients afraid you know, to go to clinics for post exposure prophylaxis. We have also tragically seen flare ups of rabies cases and deaths in some areas, uh, both in animals and in, and in people. But also we have seen uh, COVID-19 control programs applying skills and tools that were initially developed for rabies. To give an example, um, it's now really common for everyone knows about contact tracing. Um, the rabies community has been using contact tracing for a period of time now. Um, and in fact, in our own country, some of the methods that you have used for contact tracing here have been borrowed mainly from the lessons that you have learned from, uh, from rabies. Another really good example is the use of like mathematical modeling. We have used those for, for understanding, you know, time to elimination for, for rabies, but also the impact of vaccination uh, of rabies in, this, in these countries. And I'll give an example in my own country in Kenya, um, the team that has led the COVID-19 modeling uh, for, for, for Kenya developed their skills using, using rabies. So indeed, what you're seeing um, is that systems built to tackle one disease like rabies are often relevant to another, like what you're experiencing now, which is COVID-19. We are also seeing that there's much greater priority being given to One Health uh, because of COVID. And the concept of One Health has been pushed right up uh, the political agenda. Even G7 and G20 ministers and the African Union leadership are talking about One Health. Who could have imagined uh, that a few years ago? One person who is right in the middle of all this is uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Yawande Alimi. She is the Antimicrobial Resistance Program Coordinator at the Africa CDC, uh, Africa Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention. Dr. Alimi also leads uh, One Health Activities and Program Development within the Africa CDC across the African Union and its member states. Dr. Alimi, welcome to this, this session today. Uh, I'd like to ask, have you seen a change in interest or indeed that a, a spike in interest in one health and zoonotic diseases because of COVID-19? Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Tundi, it's good to see you again. Um, indeed, um, I'd like to say that um, with COVID-19, we are starting to see more strategic collaboration from human, animal and environmental health sectors at local, national, regional, at, as a matter of fact, global levels as well. In Africa, for example, um, um, with COVID-19 response, um, as much as uh, we saw it coming to the continent, um, of course, we had to put in effort um, to put um, systems in place to improve testing, um, um, strengthening surveillance systems um, prior to our first case on the continent. But one unit one unique lesson that we are starting to see and we're really proud of is that many more national governments are now exploring the possibility of shared resources across sectors. For example, COVID-19 testing. Um, quite a number of our African countries are starting to use their national veterinary labs as well as um, 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 re veterinary research labs to improve the um, amount of COVID-19 testing they are doing. As a matter of fact, um, we at the Africa Union are also showcasing this um, in a way we call leadership by example. At the AU, for example, our COVID-19 testing is done with our um, um, the Africa Union AU PANVAC, um, which is the um, veterinary um, um, arm of the Africa Union. And, and all of our COVID-19 testing is done by that facility. So one thing that we are trying to show many more governments is there's so, there's, there's so many endless possibilities to sharing resources. Um, for example, 
we're starting to see, like um, um, Dr. Tumbi mentioned, workforce. So the workforce of epidemiologists um, across sectors for joint disease investigation, as well as response activities. But most importantly, I think one unique thing that we're starting to see is also the risk communication, because um, um, with COVID-19 and community engagement, we've had to borrow so many lessons from our experiences with um, um, zoonotic disease outbreak. So I think COVID-19 has, has really, has really um, put the spotlight on One Health and zoonotic diseases. Uh, it's made it easier for policymakers to understand what we mean by zoonotic diseases. For the longest time, it seemed very very difficult to understand, but now it's easier to understand. They know that diseases can definitely jump from animals, from wildlife to humans. And now they're understanding it and they're understanding the, the, need, the reason why we need to invest across other sectors. Over to you, Tumbi. Well, thanks for that really elaborate answer on the question about a growing interest in One Health. So um, I have a second question for you. In your view, how can rabies control play a part in building what would be Africa's One Health system? Well, I, I, I strongly believe that, and, and, and like you've said, um, I, I think rabies is, is one of the lowest hanging fruits for us to really advance One Health systems in the continent. Um, I, I talk about it from um, the Africa CDC perspective. One of the things that we have done is in alignment with the global el elimination uh, uh, strategy. One of the things that we have done is we have developed a, a technical guidance, a One Health framework, whereby we have detailed step-by-step um, -step activities that are needed. Uh, and for example, rabies elimination, for example, we need One Health coordination. There's no way we're going to eliminate rabies if sectors are not working together. And it's not just working together. Is one thing we advocate strongly for is setting up formalized multi-sectorial one health coordination systems. We need to improve coordinated surveillance, improve uh, our data sharing mechanisms. Of course, you, you are quite aware about the, the gaps we have have around diagnostic capacity across um, both sectors, as well as um, coordinated response and, 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 and that skilled multi-sectorial workforce. We know that if we're able to address all of these critical gaps, we are able to accelerate the develop, uh, we're able to um, effectively control rabies. We, and, and, and this is easily applicable to any other zoonotic disease or any other issues concerning one else, once we are able to address all of these critical gaps um, using rabies, for example, it's easily applicable to any other zoonotic disease. So I think um, one of the things that we are strongly advocating for is also to um, for countries to start to see this and, 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 and embrace all of this step-by-step um, um, -step guidance, technical guidance that we have provided to them. I think lastly, one of the other things that we are really keen about is, for example, you might be aware of some of the continental initiatives from the African Union, like the African Vaccine Acquisition Trust, as well as our Africa medicine, Medical Supplies um, Platform. We strongly believe that we can leverage on these platforms to improve the supply chain uh, for rabies vaccine, as well as post-exposure prophylaxis. We need to, uh, we are strongly also advocating for local production and, and we, we strongly believe that this would lead the continent to meet the 2030 elimination goal. Over to you, Tumi. Many thanks, Dr. Alimi. I am really pleased to hear the work that Africa CDC is, is, is doing because I, I do believe that's a really big catalyst for improving health of, of the continent and we're glad that uh, rabies is on your, on your focus. Many thanks for that. I would now like to turn my attention and our attention to Professor Lucilia Blumberg from uh, South Africa. Uh, Professor Blumberg is the Deputy Director of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. is a medical consultant to the Center for Emerging Zoonotic and Parasitic Diseases. She has many other areas of expertise and leadership, uh, and for, but for the purpose of this discussion, I'll just mention one more which is uh, she has a membership of the South African Rabies Advisory Group. So you're a appropriate person to be speaking to Dr. Blumberg. Um, so Dr. Blumberg, I understand that you have had increases in rabies in certain parts of South Africa during the pandemic, uh, but some areas have been more affected than others. Um, can you elaborate, please? Yes, sir. everybody and 
Thanks very much, Dr. Wangi. It's fantastic to see a global audience and many uh, colleagues from, from Africa and Southern Africa. So you're absolutely right. Um, COVID really devastated our uh, dropped and uh, people who were exposed were not going for post-exposure prophylaxis, although it is readily available. Awareness is quite low generally. Um, I think what, what we can show with um, their One Health programs and their um, rabies programs with background uh, vaccination coverage in dogs is very different. And despite COVID, if you have good background rabies dog vaccinations, and if you have a good One Health approach, you can actually get by. So the first outbreak was in, in Kauteng, the economic hub. We don't have a lot of rabies here. Um, we have cyclical outbreaks on the periphery of the province uh, in wildlife. It sometimes spills over. We have an excellent One Health team. We all know each other. There's a rapid response. Um, not good coverage in domestic animals. Um, but when we did see the, um, the rabies increase in, in, in the jackal, uh, we were able to respond as a team to, to vaccinate dogs because there was a concern about spillover. Um, there was rapid response on the human side to make people aware and ensure that post-exposure prophylaxis was um, available. And really, we got through. The second province is uh, Cape Town, the, the beautiful city of Cape Town. No rabies in highly populated areas for 40 years. And uh, in the last month, there were two cases in, in dogs in a highly populated area, sort of semi-formal structure, lots of dogs. One of them was imported from an endemic area, um, was notified very quickly. Um, and uh, although they don't have a very strong One Health structure, everybody came together. I'm sure that was a, um, a consequence of COVID and, and working together as a good outbreak team. And um, because they had excellent vaccine coverage in that area, they contained it very quickly. There was no spread. Not so two other provinces uh, where most of the rabies in the country occurs. It's dog rabies, veterinary services are patchy, fell apart during COVID, um, and, and really not a good One Health team, particularly in the one province. And um, I think the rabies was missed. There are now huge numbers of rabies cases in dogs, um, a number of cases in humans, and huge resources have been needed um, to, to, to try and bring this under control. And we're far from getting there. So I think background coverage is very important to make sure that you maintain good coverage in dogs. The One Health team that you can get going immediately if there's a problem and who speak to each other is really the way to go, even if you have a devastating pandemic like COVID. Thanks very much. Thanks oh, to me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bloomberg, for that uh, really elaborate answer. Um, and it sounds to me like there are areas that have had new introductions of rabies and some that had the disease before are now having prayer labs. So, are there broader lessons uh, here for building One Health systems? Can rabies really be a platform to build a, a sustainable One Health uh, One Health model? Yeah. I'm afraid you're breaking up. I, I, I'm in a... Sorry, Dr. Bloomberg, um, it's breaking up a little bit. Mountain, air, mountainous area. Sorry, I think we might have lost Dr. I'm Bloomberg, uh, she, I'm, oh, you're back. back. Welcome now. back. Sorry, <laughs> Welcome I think back. the cloud came over the mountain. Sorry. <laughs> just go ahead. I, I think you can just repeat the question briefly. Sorry. Yes, uh, I was asking, um, given uh, your experience so far, particularly during the pandemic time, are there broader lessons 
platforms here for building One Health uh, systems? Can Rebis be a platform to build a sustainable One Health model? So I think it can be, you know, it, it, it's uh, the components are well described. I think people are becoming more familiar with rabies on the human side. Um, it has a very emotive component to it. Um, I think the veterinary side, it, it's an issue because dogs don't have an economic value. Um, whereas, you know, livestock and uh, people being taken away because there's a foot and mouth outbreak um, to deal with that is, is a problem. But I think it's a good start. Um, I have to say, COVID, people have spoken about COVID kickstarting One Health. I think the pandemic has expanded so much in the human side, people have forgotten about the source and are not thinking about it, and it's not confirmed. And that's, uh, that's not doing the One Health cause much good, even though at least the politicians and higher level are speaking about One Health approach. Um, but I would hope that rabies um, is the kickstart to, to other One Health programs. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, like um, Dr. Alimi mentioned, it's, it's a, such a low hanging fruit uh, to show how to do One Health. And, and, and it's great to hear you know, your, your comments about uh, what you're experiencing in South Africa, but also what the role of rabies can be in building some sustainable for One Health uh, as a model. So I'm afraid our time is up and many thanks Dr. Bloomberg and Dr. Alimi, Alimi for this opening discussion on rabies in the context of COVID-19 and One Health. Uh, I am now very pleased to hand over to Dr. Bernadette Abella Rida, who is the team leader of the Neglected to Not Diseases at the World Health Organization for an accession, and who is obviously a good friend of rabies having uh, you know, worked on this for a period of time. Please go ahead. Thank you, Toby. And hello, everyone. I'm Bernadette Bella Ritter, as you've heard, and I work on the zoonotic diseases in our department, but also lead the work on, on rabies. I'm also participating in United Against Rabies, and I'm really pleased to see you all here with us today. And um, seeing that the United Against Rabies Forum has picked up momentum and really is building uh, an engagement in the countries to see us be successful towards reaching zero rabies debt by 2030. And then our work is not over. We will need to progress to um, breaking transmission, but a first milestone would be something we can all celebrate together. This session will be looking into a deeper dive into um, community engagement and working at the grassroots of rabies elimination. But before I go into uh, introducing our distinguished speakers today, I would like to take a moment to um, spotlight a brand new course that we have just published on Open WHO, which is um, a course about all about rabies. It has been designed for both the public audience, but also some specific um, content for practitioners to help those working in rabies endemic countries especially. So I'd like to thank especially uh, Deborah Nadal and Joss Kessels for leading this project. Um, and we will be posting um, the, the link um, in the course of this, of this, um, of this discussion. What you will be able to do in a course of three hours, you'll be able to complete the course and at the end, we will be able to provide you with a certificate of completion um, for this rabies course. And now on to our speakers. I would like to welcome Dr. Nassim Salahuddin. She's a specialist in infectious diseases in the Indus Hospital and Health Network in Karachi, Pakistan. And then I would like to introduce Dr. Nigel Swift from vaccine manufacturer Bernier Ingelheim. And also Dr. Ori Piral uh, Yurachai, who works at the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. So let's start at the community level. Dr. Salahuddin, you have been working with local communities for many years in Karachi and in other places in Pakistan. I have visited uh, 
your sites and, and it's quite impressive what even someone who's actually embedded in a hospital system can do with reaching out to communities, with even leading vaccination programs in dogs. Um, and really something I, I was so impressed about is, is really the outreach to patients, the management of patients that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would like to ask you a, a simple question. It seems like a simple question. Why is community engagement so important, Nassim? Thank you, Bernadette, for your question. It's very nice to meet you again. You know, for uh, at the Indus Hospital in Karachi, for a long, long time, we have been running the Rabies Prevention Center. And uh, as of 2020, we had treated over 7,000 patients with dog bites, half of them category three, uh, two and three. And we'd been doing this so long, but a point came where we said, you know, we've got to change track or at least shift the paradigm and do something more. Now, many of these patients came from uh, different distant areas, but one area that we identified was only about five kilometers away from the hospital is a fishing village. And uh, so we went out there to see why we were getting more, a lot of patients from there. We went out there and met the chairman of the union council and said, uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, now this community is heterogeneous with uh, ethnic, cultural, religious, linguistic uh, diversity. And we had to really move very slowly and come to the level of their understanding. Uh, the uh, union council uh, head introduced us to the community. Uh, uh, at first they were very curious they were skeptical, wondering what, why we were there. Maybe we had come looking for votes or what. But uh, then uh, some were reluctant. Uh, but then as we met more and more, uh, meetings were arranged by uh, with dozen community members. And we told them about dog bites and rabies and how the uh, villagers could protect themselves. We handed out flyers and posters to shopkeepers, to housewives, to schools, and um, uh, sort of teaching them not to provoke dogs, wash the wounds immediately, and to reach the hospital for further care. Then when we suggested to them that we would like to begin vaccination of stray animals and reduce the animal uh, population by surgical means, they were actually very excited about it and they allotted a piece of land to us to park the vehicles, to um, put in our equipment, the cages and so on and on. And uh, they produced, uh, they provided us water and electricity and even gave their meeting room, uh, the community hall for us to meet there. And as a mark of their hospitality, they would treat us with, uh, with uh, tea and uh, samosa. So uh, we knew that we were accepted. So what we did was we selected the field workers and vets from among the community. And uh, later on, we trained them after giving a series of lectures and so on. So really that's how we began our pilot project of Rabies Fee Pakistan. That was really the incubator, so to say, in which we then subsequently vaccinated and surgically sterilized uh, stray animals. So what we learned through this experience is that community engagement and trust building is the basic approach for any project, any project that you might undertake. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salaruddin. Um, and I've been recently on, on a national um, rabies meeting of, of Pakistan. And, and I have a question for you. Do you feel that progress can be accelerated? And what does that require? Well, you know, mass dog vaccination and population control is a big challenge. We all know that. And it has to be coordinated at multiple levels of the government. We've been quite persuasive and we've raised awareness in electronic and uh, print media uh, so that the civil society and animal rightists have uh, joined forces with us. Uh, even the local government has approached us recently to be their technical advisors. Uh, since we already have over three years of experience in uh, mass dog vaccination and population control. And then uh, last week, um, we had a great webinar in which the Minister of Health, the Director General of Health, the uh, Executive Director of 
NIH and uh, members of the provincial governments came and expressed their views. And um, sorry to say, but it was pretty dismal that not much has been done. This is not yet even a notifiable disease. But anyway, they listened to us very carefully and they have now pledged to take rabies as a national issue. And uh, this was well reported in the press. And tomorrow, which is World Rabies Day here, we have called a press conference and uh, uh, plan multiple activities in schools, hospitals, on the streets. And uh, I'm sure the public will have expectations to create change. So I think this has been our modus operandi and I hope it works. I think it will, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you. It's been um, always very encouraging and uh, you're a true champion in this. And, and it's amazing the time I've been on the subject, how much has been achieved, starting small and expanding um, progressively. And that's been um, partly to your championing the, the subject. Thank you very much. And now let's um, move on to Dr. Nigel Swift. Beringer Ingelheim is one of the world's leading manufacturers of canine rabies vaccine. We know that vaccine production is a challenge, mainly because demand is so inconsistent and planning is important in the vaccine manufacturing. I believe you are offering support for countries seeking to put sustained national programs in place and ensure vaccines can be supplied more consistently. Please tell us more. You're, um, you're muted, Nigel. Wonderful. Thank you, Bernadette. And I appreciate you noting that we can offer best pricing when customers can commit to, to long-term orders um, so that we can optimize production capacity and, and share that value. And that's our company or any other vaccine manufacturer that people are working with. But many on this call know, and it's just highlighted with your conversation with Dr. Salahuddin that rabies control goes way beyond having safe and efficacious product. We understand that much of the challenge of mass vaccination is in the planning, execution and monitoring and connecting the dots in these um, campaigns. And so we are therefore committing to develop a program that supports the planning, execution and monitoring of rabies mass vaccination campaigns. This program would include two full-time staff dedicated to the program, providing support for planning, implementation, monitoring of field activities drawn from OAE, FAO, um, WHO best practices and learning from experiences like the Indus Hospital. And it's really, you know, we, we've done this in FMD where we've supported countries gain endorsement for their FMD control programs. And we want to do the same in rabies, offering our experts, project managers as a resource to cities and states that are committed to rabies elimination. And so we really see ourselves as a as a future partner here, Bernadette, um, for planning, execution, monitoring of these campaigns focused on a One Health outcome that looks at improving human lives through, through dog vaccination. That's excellent news, Nigel, and it would be a wonderful contribution. I know many countries um, do ask for this type of support, so this would be a really added value uh, to the United Against Rabies Forum and to the movement towards zero by rabies. But who would be eligible for this program and when will your team be ready uh, and in place to provide that support? Great question. We're, we're all impatient. Um, we got commitment from the organization for, for the funding, which is a, um, a big internal step. I would say the program is in development over the next six months and we'll, we'll come back to you with a, with a clear announcement um, the team will be in place and trained by mid-2022 and would then be able to support whether it's local government, national government or communities. The point is to increase the number and eff efficacy of mass vaccination campaigns. And um, just to point out, the program is not contingent on using our vaccines. It's really a company commitment to say we want to be a partner in this global fight against rabies. 
Thank you, Nigel. And, and we definitely need um, those type of additional expertise and resources to, to get the job done. So thank you very much for that announcement. Comes at a timely moment as we celebrate World Rabies Day. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yurachai, you're a veterinarian working in the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand, and you are very fortunate to have the support of the Thai royal family for rabies elimination. Can you tell us more about Thailand's focus on rabies free zones? And I believe you have a map to show us for this. Oh, yes, of course. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving me an opportunity to present what, what uh, we have done so far in, to eliminate rabies in Thailand. And um, uh, from the beginning, oh, okay. Uh, for more than 30 years, uh, Thailand has been working on the rabies prevention and control, uh, and as well as the uh, rabies free zone declarations. Uh, that is implemented in year 2015. Uh, the, decla the declarations uh, was using five criteria, so the human case and animal rabies, uh, dog population survey, animal vaccinations, and dog population control. Um, can, uh, do, do I need to share my slide? Okay. Okay. From my slide? Okay. And with these five criteria, all districts around Thailand has been graded every year. And uh, we found that some area has been passed all criteria. However, uh, in the past three years, the number of the cases was still remain. So until the year 2019, we have like a project, uh, it's called the Saving Animals and Human Lives from rabies projects uh, has been established following the determinations of Professor Dr. Her Royal Highness Princess Tulapon Mahidon. And as a result of collaborative from many sectors, that is a good way. Uh, so the rabies free area establishment uh, and the raising public awareness and the participations and rabies prevention across borderline are the top three priorities in this project. And for more for for two years, we have been trying to push the rabies free area project, initiating it at Smoy District. As you can see, it's a, a south uh, in the south part of Thailand, and this project is to find the way to declare rabies free area offici officially and to find the gap of rabies free area establishment uh, that could use for applying to the other area as well. And from this project, we learned that the cooperative from NGOs and the partner uh, were the huge impact on the animal, uh, on animal management, such as uh, vaccinations, sterilizations, and uh, and we found that a high percentage of animal population control can indicate the high awareness and responsibility on their pets among the populations in Smoy Island. I mean the owner, and the last one is the social participation among the uh, Sorry. However, um, to establish free area officially, a politic announcement should be pushed forward among the stakeholders. Okay. For my in some in my summary, I would like to emphasize that to eradicate or eliminate rabies in in any area, the social cooperative. Uh, among populations and the collaborative among stakeholders, not only the government sector, but also from the NGOs, are the key to achieve and the understanding on rabies elimination should be communicated in policy level to the grassroots simultaneously. So this is we have what we have done so far. Um, I would like to emphasize you that um, um, rabies in Thailand is now stand remain 
but in this number we have like a, a fortunate that we we have the termina uh, determinations from Professor Dr. Her Royal Princess Tula Pond Mahidon to push uh, the, the elimination project in Thailand. So we can gather uh, all the stakeholders to, to, to have like a same goal in order to eliminate this disease in Thailand. That's over to you. Thank you, Dr. Yurachai. It's a wonderful um, example of, of really building a momentum and having, again, champions to, to build that advocacy around the elimination of rabies. I, I just wonder, has uh, COVID affected um, the, the progress in, in uh, achieving the goals set by Thailand for rabies? Yes, I would say the COVID has a lot of impacts to our country. I, I think that in any country in the world, um, let me say, uh, last two years, we have the internet in initiative project with Laos PDR to control rabies across the borderline. But this project has been stopped due to the COVID-19 and we have to um, uh, focus more on the, the, the pandemic. So. I think that after the pandemic has stopped, uh, we can start again on the elimination rabies across border. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now is a chance to have all your questions answered. And, and I will start with one perhaps to Nassim Salahuddin. The offer of uh, Beringer Ingelheim to support uh, rabies programs, not directly through vaccines, but um, through uh, more the planning and the, and the project management support. Would that be of use to the work that you're doing, for example, in Karachi? You're muted. Sorry. Uh, BI has been extremely helpful to us in the past couple of years. Uh, they've given us, um, I think, over 10,000 collars uh, that we put around uh, the sterilized or the uh, vaccinated dog. And they also gave us a, a good volume of uh, vaccine. You know, these vaccine, animal vaccines are available to the private veterinarians, but at a, at a huge expense. Now, um, for the, uh, uh, but it, it really is prohibitive for vaccinating uh, hundreds of thousands of free roaming dogs throughout the country. So uh, any kind of support from BI would be most welcome. Yeah, we, we would love to have that. In fact, the other provinces have been looking into it and they've been asking when, when can we get their support? I think it would be fantastic. It would really help us a lot. Thank you, Nassim. What about uh, Dr. Yurachai? Have you had any, um, any events where there have been problems with the quality of, of um, dog or human rabies vaccines? Um, I would say that a little problem, but we can solve it uh, very fast, I, I would say, because uh, last year we have a problem with the, 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 uh, the, the animal vaccine um, shortage. But uh, uh, this problem has been solved uh, within like um, two months, I, I guess. And for the vaccinations in human, I don't think that we have the problem like that. Uh, we have like campaign to, uh, to educate people that if they got bitten by dogs or, or any uh, animals, you should um, contact the doctors and or or, or the primary uh, primary hospital um, to to access the, the, the health care and they 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 will this uh, consider of the rabies post posture prophylaxis and right now we provide rabies pre pre exposure prophylaxis for for the eligible person, like uh, veterinarians uh, who are working on the rabies uh, sterilizations or vaccinations or the 
um, health volunteer who who need to um, uh, um, um, touch or contact to the dogs uh, frequently. Uh, and for the project poster prophylaxis, we provide to all uh, all populations in Thailand, uh, no no matter what who they who, who they are, and um, from and and we increase the the the, the access access accessing to the vaccine to the populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We we have a question on our. Um, a question to Dr. Swift. Thank you for the announcement and for your great leadership. Is it possible to say what is your experience um, at, at overcoming major barriers to national rabies elimination programming? And you mentioned the opportunity of getting better vaccine prices from long-term purchase agreements. Where are we at the collaboration with Gavi on vaccine purchasing? That's a tough one. So it's a, I can help you. I can help you. <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. I um, look. Maybe, maybe I'll throw a couple of points in that I think are worth mentioning. Um, so, in terms of experience, as I said, as, as a company, we the, the concept of this came partly from experience of some people in the team with rabies control, saying we want to do this better. We've got the product is no longer the issue. As long as there's a decent product, um, then it's let's maximize the return on investment for what is a huge investment to plan a campaign, to make sure that we are planning this camp properly. We, we know where the dogs are. We know how to mobilize resources. We know how to track the ones we've vaccinated and how to measure the outcomes appropriately. So that, that's where this comes from. And as I said, we've we have a lot of experience with other diseases like foot and mouth disease, where we've really worked for a long period of time with companies to get them onto the OIE progressive um, path, control pathway and, and walk with them through that process. In terms of managing the cost, I, I'm, I'm going to bring up one point that I think is we, we if we can supply vaccines in 10 ml multi-dose vials, that is one vial does 10 dogs, we can halve the cost of the vaccine we supply versus tenders that request, request that we provide one individual one ml vials. And so if you're gonna organize a campaign where you've got large numbers of dogs together and use multi-dose vials, you can cut in half your cost of, um, of vaccines. Likewise, planning capacity you know we know that if we can plan three or four months out um, to produce vaccines for an order and ship in bulk we can dramatically reduce costs so i think there's there's that piece and now i'm going to throw it back to you for the gabby question <laughs> thank you so gabby included rabies in their investment strategy in 2019 that was for human uh rabies vaccines as a post-exposure prophylaxis um uh as opposed to exposure prophylaxis, it would be eligible to members of Gavi. Now, uh, since COVID, they have put all of these um, new investments uh, on hold, but that will be hopefully uh, restarted soon. Um, they have, for now, worked only on human vaccines, uh, but we are looking into other mechanisms to um, see how we can scale up also the access to dog vaccination. And OIE does have an, um, a vaccine bank where countries through their chief veterinary officer with a request to the director general can um, request for vaccines with a plan um, to, um, to kickstart some of their programs. It would not be a replacement to a program, but it would be a, a catalyst to kickstart um, programs. Um, I hope that answers the question. So um, I'm looking at some other. <laughs> uh, Nigel, you, you've got a lot of interest here. How can we contact Beringer Ingelheim? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm happy to. I'm happy to share my um, my contact details and um, and direct questions in the in the right direction. So one question 
um, perhaps I, uh, Alimi, if you're still online, um, how did you manage to gain the political interest and commitment of African countries in your region? If you want to take the floor. And if uh, Alimi is not on, Nassim, have you got any tips and tricks in a, in a, a country like yours where there are so many different priorities? How do you build that political interest and commitment on a disease that affects um, rural populations with less of a voice than other populations? How have you been building that political interest? <clears throat> it's been very challenging, Bernadette, to say the least. Uh, there are so many competing uh, diseases. Tuberculosis is high on the list. There's HIV, there's hepatitis, malaria, dengue, you name them. Uh, we are really a crucible of IDs over here in the country. Uh, I've been trying to catch their interest mainly through um, personal connections uh, with uh, authorities in Islamabad, in the capital, where the NIH and the ministry is, and uh, uh, contacting one to another, so really using personal resources to get to them. And I think I pretty much caught their ear through this uh, webinar we held uh, last week. And um, uh, and then there's a kind of a storm gathering over it. And the press is also highlighting the issue of dog bites and uh, rabies. And, uh, you know, we don't really have a, a, a central data for uh, for rabies or, or dog bites, but the press highlights them so much that everybody has now gotten into it. NGOs have gotten onto the bandwagon and there is pretty much quite a bit of activity from urban areas to rural areas. And I think this is where it's going to uh, head in that direction. And I, I think this will have to bring it to the attention of the authorities, they have to do something. And I'm, I'm hopeful they will. Thank you very much, Nassim. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I would compliment your answer. Use uh, the United Against Rabies Forum to build your profile. Send us those stories to, um, to the Global Rabies Coordinator so that we can highlight what, what is the extent of the problem? Where are your barriers? What can we do as a community to support you? Use us also as your amplifier and um, an amplifier of good success stories, but also of those places which are, you know, those, those things that you encounter that are difficult to overcome and we can see how we can problem solve together. So I think we are now coming close um, to, um, to the end of our webinar. I would like to say thank you to our speakers who have contributed not only to this webinar, but really in moving um, the momentum on, uh, on the fight against rabies. And of course, to say thank you also for the announcement of um, Beringer Ingelheim. It's great news and I think you will have a lot of demand. And World Rabies Day is tomorrow. So I hope we all have something to, to um, contribute to making World Rabies Day a successful day where we, whether we're in endemic countries or non-endemic countries, rabies affects all of us and we should um, be working towards this together. So I, I wish you all the best in raising awareness and then in the countries where rabies is endemic, boosting those rabies control efforts. And now I just want to preview the two upcoming webinars that will take place next week and the following week. Don't forget that to join in again. We will have next Monday on the 4th of October at the same time, also on Zoom, a discussion focused on data, tools and monitoring. And it will be led by the United Against Rabies Working Group 1. And the following week uh, on the 11th of October, please join us in a discussion at the same time on national and regional control plans. And this will be led by the United Against Rabies uh, Forum Working Group 2. And uh, do share widely the resources that we have posted in uh, the chat for you, the new, um, the new training course on rabies 
the webinars so that people who are interested in joining can also access this. And with that, I would like to um, say thanks once again. Wish you all the best in all your efforts. Contact us, keep us informed, engage with the network, and we will try to reach that goal, whether challenging or not, uh, of, 20, uh, of zero rabies deaths by 2030. Thanks again. Thank you. Ha, 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 ha.